Welcome back. Part 5 of this series addresses force is one of the two significant items that directly affects throwing a cast net for distance and a full open, particularly for heavyweights. First, here's the theory. Any object moving has momentum. And we know intuitively that a 2,000 pound car for example, going at 20 miles per hour has more momentum than a fellow on a bike whose combined weight with a bike is 200 pounds and he's going twice as fast at 40 miles per hour. And we can prove this quantitatively by multiplying the weight of each object times its speed. So in the car's example, this would be 40,000 units of momentum and this would be 8,000 units. So clearly the car has significantly more momentum than the fellow on the bike, in fact by a factor of 5. So we can now write the formula for momentum and that would be the weight of the object times its speed. If an object's moving in a straight line, it's referred to as linear momentum. An example of that is a drag racer. But if an object is moving in a circle, it would have angular momentum. Angular momentum. Because the angle of the object with respect to the center is always changing but I'm going to call it rotational momentum because it's a tad more descriptive. So a bucket of water would have rotational momentum, for example, as it swung around in a circle and similarly for the weights in a cast net. Now we need high rotational momentum to get distance plus a full open. Torque is a rotational force that gives us rotational momentum. It's sometimes referred to as low end speed needed from a stop position. More torque, more momentum. And a boxer understands this as he applies it by twisting his body when he throws a left hook for a knockout punch. To determine the amount of torque, we need to know three quantities, and in our situation, we need to know the weight of the net. We would multiply that by the acceleration of the weights, and we need to know the radius. The weight of the net is fixed, and we can determine the radius this way. We'll draw a picture of a thrower here. his arms out and the net is at rest in this position here. So the distance from his shoulders to where he grabs the net is one measurement and that's approximately two feet. The second one is the distance from the lead line to where he grabs the net if he's a right-handed thrower with his right hand and that's probably around his pocket or his hip level and that's roughly three feet. So we could say then when the net is fully extended this radius from his shoulders out to the edge of the lead line is the radius and in this case that would be five feet. So the most significant quantity we can control in this equation then is acceleration. Here's the idea. Let's say a drag racer ends up going 200 miles per hour at the end of a quarter mile track and then we put him on a three-eighths of a mile track. And he's doing 225 miles an hour, his terminal speed. His top end change in speed went from 200 to 225 because he had a change in time 
when we gave him more distance to accelerate. This distance right here, which is giving him more time. So then acceleration is simply a change in speed with a change in time. And the way you get it is with more distance whether the object is moving in a straight line or in a circle, like a cast net's weights. I'll use the analogy of a mouse trap to illustrate its wind-up, torque, and rotational momentum, all of which apply directly to throwing a net. So I'll stand the trap on end right here. I'll show the spring in the center. And then this trap wire will follow an Im imaginary circle or semicircle like this. And we could put the trap wire when it's sitting at rest right here. And we're going to wind this trap up in this direction, counterclockwise. So as we move it to here, the spring will become tighter and tighter until it reaches a maximum right here where we tie it down. This point right here is equivalent to the point where the thrower has twisted around and he's set to make the throw. Set to make the throw. The torsion is stored in the spring in the form of potential mechanical energy. And this is equivalent to the tension in a thrower's torso as he twists around. When the trap is sprung, the potential energy shows up as torque and is transferred to the trap wire, driving it in a semicircle with increasing rotational momentum. Now this is equivalent to the engine in the middle of a merry-go-round transferring its torque to the gears that turns the table of riders. And now for the practical side of the application of force. And let's start by writing the most critical quantity we have to focus on for rotational momentum. And we know that that's acceleration. And that's equal to the change in speed or the change in time. Now let's take a look at Bubba, who's making the leap from an 8-foot, 8 8-pound 8 net to a 12-foot, 16-pound bait net. Hopefully he tried one before he put out his money. His goal is to throw the net out to 20 feet, right here. He's right-handed, so he starts out facing 90 degrees counterclockwise with his elbows close in, palms up, and chest high. So our friend will be facing right here like this. And as he twists to the left, building tension in his torso, the weights will trail around inside this imaginary circle until they stop in behind him. His arms are now just pointing to the left of 180 degrees or about 200 degrees right here. We can have his arms like so. At this instant he has maximum mechanical energy in his torso for the low end torque he's going to need to get this heavy net moving. So his net then came around something like this. So he'll immediately start twisting to his right as soon as the net stops here with his elbows out from his body as far as possible and as quickly as possible to obtain the maximum radius of five feet. And he'll continue applying force in the form of torque until the launch point and I'll follow through until, his, until he ends up facing the target. So he's going to come around like so. Now for the horn to land directly on this target, the leads must be launched from a single point on this imaginary circle. 
And this single point is referred to as tangent to the circle, and it's found by an imaginary line drawn from the target to the imaginary circle where it would just touch it. It's exactly at this point, and only at this point, for this distance and radius that the leads must have enough momentum to reach the target with a full open. So we could label this then the launch point. If the net is launched early or before this critical point, it won't have enough momentum and it's going to be off the target to the left this way. But it's much more common though to see nets veer off to the right due to a late release since it's counterintuitive to many throwers to release the net earlier even when they're told to do this. And this launch point is found only by tweaking your throws and experimentation and some of your practice. Let's assume that Bubba's first attempt failed. This means that the leads never had enough rotational momentum. The question now is what should he do next? And the answer is in the formula for acceleration right here by giving him more time and distance. He needs to apply more force over more time and distance. Remember how the drag racer went from 200 to 225 in speed when we gave him more distance and time to accelerate? It's no different here. So Bubba's going to move to a new start point from here by moving around the imaginary circle in an additional 95 or 90 degrees to give himself more time. So on his second try then He's going to be starting here facing 180. And then he's going to complete his windup facing about 290 degrees. Right in here. So his arms will be out like so. And the net would have come from this resting position during his windup until it came in behind him here. And he's going to accelerate now, pivoting around all the way up to the launch point and ending up once again facing the target. So he's going to come around this time now, like so. And we're going to label this extra distance for acceleration as plus RM for rotational momentum that he's gained by starting later in the circle. And you could see here that this is his extra rotational momentum. This spot right here. You could see where he lost energy here because he was outside or inside I should say of the imaginary circle. But Bubba's finding that this is taking a lot more effort than he first anticipated and can only get the net out to 15 feet. But he knows what to do now. On his third try, he could just move around 45 degrees to here, for example, and on his fourth try, out to here to give himself more time to make the throw and get his speed up. But just to, get, just to make a point and move along here, let's assume that Baba settles on 15 feet because he just doesn't have the strength for more and he feels uncomfortable moving too far around the circle since he throws off the bow of a boat. Then that starting spot where his feet were pointing at 180 degrees right here will be the minimum distance in degrees unique to him for that net. So his minimum distance then I'm going to write down is 180 degrees and his sweet spot will be another 25 degrees here. So then his total will be 205 degrees for his sweet spot. So he'll come around and his starting distance will be right here. So we can call this his sweet spot for this net. The additional 25 degrees or more is a distance to relieve some of the pressure off his torso and still be able to get the torque required to make the throw. It's like a safety factor for his body. 
Now an additional technique he can use is a snap or a surge or an impulse as a physicist would call it just before the launch point which would be right about in here by snapping his wrists to the right. This is the same technique that a home run hitter uses with his bat or a quarterback when he reaches the end of the arc of his throw for more acceleration or a hockey player making a slap shot. It can make the difference between success and failure and every thrower should incorporate this in his bag of techniques. Keep things simple with your throw. For example, don't try to spin the net open and get fancy. It might look good, but it's just wasted energy and loss in obtaining distance. If you want a nice close-in throw, just go to the fan open. And as I've said before, don't copy. Everyone is different. Find your own way and you'll be much prouder of your accomplishment. There's another force that a thrower has to contend with and seriously consider when buying a heavyweight net and that is centripetal force. We'll draw a thrower here, a stick figure of a thrower. And we'll give him a cast net like so. And in this diagram there are two forces. And the first one is called centrifugal force. That would be this force right here. And that's the one that's trying to pull the net out of your arms. So this is called centrifugal. Pulling on the arms. The second one is it's acting in this direction and this one's called centripetal force and this is the one that you're applying to keep the net going around in a circle any motion in a circle requires force directed toward the center and it's called centripetal force because it means it's a center seeking force. So this is center seeking. For the record, there's no such word as centrifugal force. We can find the magnitude of this centripetal force through the formula of force equals the mass times the velocity squared over the radius. And we could simplify this formula by substituting weight for mass times velocity, and we're interested in magnitude in this vector quantity, so we're going to use speed here times speed over the radius. It's this exponent here that tells us to multiply the variable by itself. Now what this means is that a small increase in speed means a large increase in the, f in the force. And for example, if you double the speed of your net through acceleration, you would get four times the centripetal force. So if you had two times the speed, you would get four times centripetal force. This is what you mainly feel in your arms, back, and shoulders. And it can be damaging and permanent if you're not careful. That's why an Olympic thrower is built like a tank. He throws a 16 pound ball and rotates it three to four times to achieve the highest possible speed and rotational momentum for maximum distance. Excessive or prolonged forces such as centripetal and twisting to provide acceleration can cause severe and even permanent damage to the body. These areas I'm going to highlight in red. You should be on the lookout for oncoming pain. 
and that'd be this one here again on this side this is a sciatica nerve going through the buttocks I'm not a doctor but through some painful experience I offer the following advice and the first one is don't over twist during the windup avoid this by giving yourself a minimum starting position plus you know 25 to 45 degrees as I stated earlier to give your body a safety valve the second one is at the launch point keep your back upright and straight upright and straight and the third don't overtrain. Stop and rest between throws or wait for another day. There's always tomorrow. And the fourth one is stop at the earliest signs of pain. And last but certainly not least, there's no shame. You know, in moving to a, in in uh, moving to a lighter or a smaller net. Please take care of yourself. Thank you again for watching.